Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, it has been pointed out to me that it's an odd choice of attire for <laughs> a talk <laughs> mostly about FreeBSD. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't really do it on purpose. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I didn't bring these. <laughs> no, it's uh, it was just what happened. It, it was just the T-shirt that happened to be on the, lo the lowest in the pile of <laughs> T-shirts that I brought to the conference. <laughs> so be it. I mean, a lot of it uh, will also be uh, sh should also be uh, applicable to OpenBSD. I'm just uh, focusing on FreeBSD because I'm much more familiar with it. It also applies to Linux, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, if, if you're masochistic, it might also apply to Windows. <laughs> Don't know about the preferences. <laughs> Some people have um, strange kinks. I don't know. So, um, first things first. So, uh, a bit of scope. What do I mean with reproducible? Um, I mean functionally reproducible. I don't bother to do uh, the things like the people from reproducible builds where they really want to have every checksum and every timestamp identical, which is a great project and it really does have its uses. I'm, however, not sure if Ansible is the right tool to create something like that, if you need it. Personally, I don't really have the need for it, so, and also, I tend, I mean, I could probably, but with Ansible, it could be a bit tiresome if you really want to control ev each and every file on the system. So that's also a bit out of scope. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I ran into previously was that people said, yeah, well, we're already using configuration management to set up the system, so they should be, uh, should be identical done well when practice uh, <coughs> it's a bit different and the one thing is that ansible defines itself actually more uh, the, the, defi the definition is from the website uh, it defines itself more as an automation tool than actual configuration management you can pick the differences um, but in the end it's quite useful because it's more or less procedural and it's in a way quite uh, how you would do it if you would, would do it yourself. I mean, there are specialized modules for a lot of stuff and I would, uh, in most cases, I would advise using them than just trying to manually edit files if you don't have to. Um, but even there, it's a step of, yes, I want to edit that configuration file to be that way. That doesn't mean that the rest of the system, you, you don't really control the rest of the system, which might interfere with your, um, with whatever you're currently um, uh, um, do. And also, I mean, so you always apply the same steps, but if the original system is different for whatever reason, for example, you have a newer version of FreeBSD installed, or for example, um, that the outside environment changes, the even doing the same step might not give exactly the same result if you don't take some precautions and or you decide that, yeah, in this case, I'll just ignore that because I'm fine with it. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it, it doesn't, you don't really define the target, but you basically define the steps on how to get there. Um, which actually is a, is a big advantage for, for a lot of sysadmins because the, the, it's a relatively low barrier of entry because it's in a way, I mean, yes, you have to write YAML, which, some people love, some people hate, <laughs> but it's, it's, you, you define the steps somewhat similar to what you would do otherwise. Um, so, 
since you just apply steps to a, to a system, if you really want to have identical systems, it can be advisable to um, basically start as early as possible or as early as needed. So what do I mean with that? Um, physical machines. Um, do you manage your BIOS settings, your IPMI settings, your hardware watchdog settings? Um, for VMs, the VM configuration, because it might, some things behave differently. For example, um, you want to clone a system and whoever is responsible for, if you don't, ha if, if you're in an organization where you don't do it yourself, for whatever reason, um, who is, uh, whoever is responsible for creating the VMs has now given you uh, an away booting VM instead of a BIOS booting VM or, a, or the other way around. That depending on what you do, it might r lead to different results. And keep keeping that in mind uh, is usually good. Sometimes you just decide, okay, I don't care. For my use case, it's irrelevant. It's fine. Um, there are some nice. Uh, there there are some already predefined modules for. Um, dealing with stuff like that. For example, for the for the Dell, I've done that before with the iTrack management. It's yeah, it's a bit inconvenient in so far as at least the last time I had to write it from scratch. The only functions that really worked were the ones that basically imported um, com the, the configuration settings from an XML file, which. Yeah, but I mean, I if you if you just want to have identical settings, it's still relatively easy because you can create them in one system, export it, and then tell Ansible, yes, please, both systems, thank you. Um, there are, for example, for um, Proxmox that I use for virtualization, there are predefined modules to manage VMs. Um, you can always, and I've done that before, you can always, uh, with the URL mod module, it's not that hard uh, to script REST interfaces, which a lot of stuff has nowadays. I'm not sure how the situation is with VMware. I have not used it in a probably 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think most of the, most of the stuff that got gets used in some kind of enterprise environment will probably have some kind of, of interface that you can Define and also, for example, with the with the Dell machines, um, if for example you for whatever reason have to use a hardware rate controller, um, you can also configure that via the um, via Ansible and the iTrack interface, for example. Um, then, yeah. One, one thing that can pass that is quite important. Um, if we are talking about getting the same results or every time, are your steps are your steps depending on external resources? And external in this case means external to your playbook, and or the repository that you have your playbook in. That might still be some internal GitLab repository where you might get a different result because somebody changed something there. Um, if you pull stuff from GitLab and just execute it, yeah, well, <laughs> if, if, if you pull it from, from the pub, from public GitHub, yeah, well, I mean, the old, the old DevOps installer with uh, grab that raw file from, uh, from, Git, uh, from GitHub, put it there and execute it, yeah, well, <laughs> you, can, you can still check the, you can still check the checksum to uh, make sure that it hasn't changed, but in the end, it's something completely external. Um, but still, um, there, there are a lot of, there. Uh, but also, and, and I've, had, I've had that happen to me before, when you have the situation where um, uh, you depend on, on stuff with, with, R with the r module, for example, you depend on stuff that's on your development machine at exactly that path. And then maybe your colleague runs it and gets either a different result or an error, depending on what happens. 
um, also, I mean, that the, the, the last thing doesn't necessarily um, get you a different result, but it will still produce errors if you didn't manage your uh, known host's keys. <laughs> and if you just if you just run it and don't check the out don't check the result, and yes, I've seen that where people just ran Ansible from Chrome and didn't check the result and thought, ah, everything is fine. <laughs> um, small things. <laughs> um, well, s some some so some solutions for for how to deal with um, external things. Uh, for example, uh, you have a if you deal with packages. Um, if you do quarterly, you will have a much easier. Um, I mean, yes, they change as well, but they change at the. At a, uh, at a relatively defined point, uh, because if you just use uh, if you ch if you just use latest, and then you have situations where you say, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll test it on the development machine, and if everything works uh, a week later, I'll apply the same playbook to the to, uh, to the production machine. Uh, well, if you use packages from latest, you might not get the same result. Um, which, yeah, I mean, you can either fix package, uh, I mean, you, you have the option of just uh, saying install exactly that version of the package and if that's not available, then fail. Then you have at least a defined state. It's, however, I mean, I mean it's a defined state. It might not still produce work, but it, so at least it's a defined state. Um, it is, however, can be quite a lot of work because you have to keep track of a lot of things. Um, obviously, you can have your own mirror boot your system if you say, oh, well, I really want to control what's going to be installed on my systems. It's an option. And for, yeah, I mean, for the, for, for external files, you can do everything from, yeah, having your, own, having your own mirror that gets updated in a defined manner you can at least use checksums. You can, I mean, you can also just download load them to your local machine and always copy it out from the local machine. I'm doing that for some stuff. Uh, the only downside is that if it's big files uh, and you're behind an asymmetric internet connection, that can be annoying <laughs> at times, uh, depending on where you sit. If you're in an envi environment where you have uh, symmetrical gigabit link anyway, then yeah, well, <laughs> so be it. Um, yeah. And also, I mean, to, to a degree, uh, with, uh, especially with internal resources, it's a bit of a question of, of procedures. Do, do I want to have, uh, so do, do, can, can I change the procedure so that I can track the resources that I'm copying around or using to install the service, do, can I can I track them in the same Git repository then that I track the um, playbook in? If I can't do that, I mean, I can still say, okay, we have, for example, if we use a CI CD system, we have a defined system where it's in some way guaranteed that if I reference a release, that will not change. So it's not a, not always a technical solution, <laughs> um, depending on your environment. Um, yeah, well, with editing files. So one of the one of the things that you do in configuration management a lot about from apart from installing stuff, it's modifying files in some way or another. So, I mean, if you just want to have small changes, there is. It's, it's relatively convenient to just say, well, line in file, um, try to match whatever and change it to whatever. Um, that works fine. However, um, one of the big problems that you run into is so um, you're depend for the whole for the whole for the content of the whole file, you're dependent on what you start with. And 
so if you install a system at some at a specific point, you will start with a specific version of the configuration file that was shipped with version 765. <laughs> and if you try to set up a new system, um, you will probably start with a newer version of the config file shipped. If you do the same modification, it might create the same result than the, the old configuration file with the newer package version that you have on your old system. It might not. So what, y what can you do? You can, I mean, use template and, re uh, template and or completely replacing it and copy over the whole configuration file every time which means a bit more tracking of stuff in, y in your repository. On the other hand, you can be sure that it will be exactly as you intended it to be. It might still break, obviously, <laughs> over time <laughs> if your configuration file is no longer compatible with the, with the old version. Um, but you can, you can solve a lot of the problems. Um, there is also, uh, I mean, a lot of the, f a lot of the time you have you have you have a lot of uh, version uh, things to do. Um, one of the big things um, where I ran into problems with different um, wi with different uh, interactions between a newly set up system and a system that has grown over time is, I mean, there it's quite convenient. There is a lot of things nowadays that have include uh, include directories as part of their configuration file. Um, Nginx, jails, whatever. And a lot of people, including myself, like to just say, okay, I'll just create a template for whatever, if I want to create a jail, I'll just have a template that drops a file into the, uh, into the jailsd directory, and it will be picked up. So far, so good. And if I add another jail to my configuration, there will be another jail. However, have you checked that you actually remove the file when you <laughs> when you removed it when you remove the definition from your data in your playbook? Um, depending on how exactly the include works, some of the stuff defined in the file include it might actually be global and then you might by accident reference it somewhere else. Uh, that has happened to me with Nginx, <laughs> where basically um, since the, the upstream definitions, uh, some of the upstream definitions were global, uh, basically uh, it only worked because of the uh, old definition somewhere else that should not have been active anymore. <laughs> so um, it's convenient, but one should be aware of the potential problems. Um, I mean, of course, you can, especially with things like Nginx, you can create a template that will just create one big configuration file for everything, uh, which works perfectly. The only problem is that the template might get a bit um, convoluted over time and, and complicated and hard to debug. but. Yeah, I mean that's the some some of the things. So for a small note, I think probably most of you already know it. Um, I mean the templating is done with Jinja two, which is really powerful. Um, it can be a bit hard to debug in the if if you get errors uh, in in Ansible, it can be a bit of a pig to debug. Um, I'm going over it a bit uh, faster in, in some areas because I want to show some things in the end as well. Um, so also for commands, there is always the question if you have something there where there is no direct way to do it. Of course, you can rock, uh, run commands in different versions. You have command, which has the advantage of say, where you can at least say, okay, um, this command, by the way, uh, creates that file. And if that file already exists, don't execute it again. Um, raw is relatively use is useful for things like installing Python because it has no dependencies at all. 
but it also is a bit hard to deal with to try not to execute it if it would not do any changes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, expect is in the area from, yeah, I have to script some program that was meant to be interactive. Uh, I try to avoid it personally, actually, but. Um, yeah, I mean th that was what the what I first point pointed out. I mean, the, the splitting out part is quite useful because it, it makes for simpler, it makes for simpler, smaller um, structures. Um, it can be solved, I've, I've seen it be being solved by explicitly in, in, in including the files and then you don't have, then you then files might still lay around but they're no longer used. It's, it's always, I, I think with, with a lot of the things, it's more or less always a thing with how much work do I want to put in? What do I really need? Um, how much time do I have for, for stuff? And I mean, the other thing is also, yes, I know it's, it's seldomly true, but sometimes one knows that you will only use it once or twice and the, the system will go away soon. Unfortunately, systems have a way of staying around. <laughs> I have I have been in the in the business for some years now. Um, related, um, what can also be quite nice um, to have because another problem where you run into interesting problems um, with with uh, things is if you define your date if you define your data multiple times in your playbook because you need the data in multiple formats that also then tends to have interesting problems at times because you then forget to adapt something somewhere so for things like that filters are quite useful and really powerful actually because you basically nearly every transform you can find um, the look of filters are actually quite nice and it's also I can show a small, um, small example um, later. It's really not hard to, to, to write a filter. It's basically a Python module with two functions that somehow reads the input and then put, creates whatever you wanted to create with it in the output. Um, on the, the same thing where you can say, okay, Get, get the data from somewhere else where it's already defined. On, on the same note, to not define data multiple times where you then run into the problem that you have inconsistencies. Um, that one is, can, can be a bit tricky. I, I just put it in for more or less for, for completeness sake. It's also a, a quite interesting feature um, connection plugins can be quite useful if you, for example, want to have jails that don't have an SSH daemon running. Uh, for example, with the Ansible SSH jail, unfortunately, I also ran into some interesting problems because then the become doesn't work correctly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that can be a bit annoying to deal with. So it, it always depends on, on what you want to do. Um, and some, yeah, it's, but what is really quite useful, especially for, for, for the whole thing, for starting from scratch is the, the local transport when you just say, um, yes, please run these modules on my local machine. If you, for example, want to script some rest interface for as we put it, uh, creating a virtual machine, um, adapting the adap adapting the automatically adapting the monitoring so that the monitoring for the new host behaves correctly. Um, that at times you need to you need you actually need to not only you can run it locally but you need to run it locally because um, your machine might be in a DMC somewhere and then you have the problem that it probably shouldn't be able to access uh, your monitoring 
configuration interface. Um, also with with uh, delegations, you have the same you have you have the same thing, and there you are back you are back on trying to control everything. So for example, I tend to if I create if I create a host, I also automatically um, configure the backup for it, so that I don't have any unpleasant uh, experiences that somebody, yeah, we created this new host. Um, I will do the backup later. <laughs> Nothing will happen on it until then. It's fine. Uh, in my experience, you find out that you didn't do it when you actually need the backup. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I usually I'm in, a, I'm in an environment where I deal with humans and humans make errors, including myself. It's not like I, it's a picking on users. Uh, it's much easier for an admin to create a big problem that needs a backup than for a user because the user might not be able to delete everything. The admin actually <laughs> quite likely can delete everything <laughs> or mangle everything. I've also heard people who forgo just forgot uh, uh, a where clause in a delete statement in a database. <laughs> 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 and if you also, if, if you for some reason also have an auto commit en enabled, then yeah, <laughs> you're back at, uh, do we have a backup? Um, yeah, also, which is actually, um, I got, got quite interesting especially once you also start to create, um, once you really enable everything, uh, really try to control everything. Uh, in my experience, um, your inventory tends to grow. And while, I mean, the most, the most basic, the, the most, uh, probably all of you have seen the most basic um, version of an Ansible inventory, which is basically an ini file with a list of hosts with some group definitions. Um, if it gets bigger, at some point uh, you will lose track of stuff, especially if you maybe need the same inventory in multiple projects. Um, well, the dynamic inventories are quite useful there and come to the rescue. And it's actually quite simple because as with a lot of other stuff, Ansible has this interesting notion that, well, yeah, this file is, exe is executable, so I'll pretty much read it, but I will execute it and see what it gives me back. And, well, I mean, the dynamic inventory basically just needs, needs, you, uh, needs you to print out the inventory data in a JSON format. And so, for example, get, getting, getting the list of virtual machines from whatever virtualization environment you're running might not be that hard to get. Um, I've also done it before when, you, when I, had, uh, I had to deal with a few hundred embedded systems that I didn't want to manually enter in <laughs> and keep track of in an inventory because, well, <laughs> the data is already there somewhere. And I've also I've also previously used um, uh, used basically the um, the option of if you have any kind of management system for your environment where you already keep track of uh, what systems do we have, what should they do, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean that's it's also quite nice to just pull it out because then you just define it once when you when you when you document your environment and you already have to have the information okay this this host is in the group somewhere and why why not reuse the information in deploying stuff which again helps with having a consistent state and not having any uh, ha having not that many um, ex um, surprises because you forgot, you forgot, ah, yeah, but that came from there and that came from there. Um, you only have to look at, if, if, if you say, okay, I want to duplicate that host, you look it up in your documentation system and say, okay, that's the definition of the host, let's duplicate that. 
and ideally you have a, you, you have 100 percent of it uh, of a duplication um, obviously you're back to uh, ob obviously you're back to depending on where you get your data um, the problem is you're back to some external dependency that you need to trust yes on the other hand if you don't trust your own documentation um, it might be a good thing to also think about what to do about that because that can also be quite annoying if your system don't really correspond for what you do with your documentation. Um, that's another, that's another um, thing. So I applied a state, uh, I applied something and then uh, Maybe I need to do some cleanup. Maybe I need to do some checks. Um, it's always helpful to not. So, for example, if you um, if, if you if you edit a configuration file, the simple the, 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 the sim obviously the first choice would be okay. I have a step where I edit the configuration file. Next step, reload the configuration file. Um, problem there is that it gets a bit hard to judge the outcome in the end because in the end um, Ansible normally will show you a nice summary of what's actually what has actually happened and ideally you want to have it in the bodent so that if nothing changed the, the step will not show uh, show up in the changed stuff um, the simple thing is the handler where um, it can just say, okay, if that changed, do whatever. Most commonly used to just say, okay, I just edited my web server config, so I might want to reload it to actually apply it. Um, problem with that is that that only works uh, with a single with single things, so. For example, I, I ran into the situation when creating containers that I basically have uh, a loop creating the container. But the problem is I, c I can't use a handler there because I could only have I only have one uh, one handler. But if I create or if I modify like five jails, I don't want to res uh, uh, five jails out of ten. I don't want to restart all ten jails. I might only want to restart the one that I actually touched. Uh, and for that, it's, it's quite useful. So you can uh, register, you, you can say register something, and then it will put the output of whatever happened in the step into an array, and then you have an array that you can, you can deal with. Um, that's, no, that's not so much about, that's not so much about, um, having making sure that it, it always does the same but in this case it's more about having a chance to actually check what happened what what what, what was the state so for example you can just run it again afterwards and then uh, then it will most likely if you if it was if you were thorough with it um, it will just say okay nothing changed then you know okay everything worked the first time and I don't have something that's changing all the time because I have some interaction somewhere. Um, that's actually one of the things that I've run into quite a bit or have helped other people debug, um, which leads back to saying, okay, I already have, yeah, I already have a playbook to, that defines this host. So we'll just run it, we'll copy the host wars and maybe adapt some mi minimal things because some ports or IP addresses or any something are different and then apply it to the next host. Uh, the problem is if you, as it happens, developed it over time, um, you, might have, you might have circular dependencies that, you, that are not automatically solvable. So what I do I mean with that? 
one relatively common problem that I ran into and I've seen in, 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 the, in, in other people's playbooks is um, we a simple web server configuration. So you start up, say, okay, this is the basic configuration of my web server. Um, that's the path where the, the ACME challenges lie. Fine. Then you run it, you request your certificate, wire whatever ACME client you want to use, ACME does SH, dehydrated, cert bot, personal preferences. Um, then you know, oh, now I have the certificates, I'll add to the I'll, I'll add to my configuration data for my web server. I'll just add the HTTPS bindings. Everything works. Well, now I just, I duplicated the configuration for the host and I'll try to apply it to a new host. It will most likely fail because your web server won't configure because it says, well, yeah, but you said I should use this certificate, but it's not there. And there are, I mean, there are, mu yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get, so I mean, there, there are multiple ways to handle it. So um, you can either, you can either sh uh, make sure that you create your web server configuration in steps, but then you have to be a bit careful if you run it against the already running system that it doesn't for 30 seconds tear down your web server <laughs> and interrupt all your connections. Um, one other thing that I, with nowadays that I actually do with Let's Encrypt specifically in this case is uh, I just use uh, DNS01 challenge which once you have the infrastructure set up is not that much more uh, work and I need it for some cases anyway. Um, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not impossible to deal with. It's just that something if, if you really want to have the option and depending on your environment, uh, the person writing and developing the playbooks might not be necessarily be the same person deploying a new server. You might have some junior admin or, I mean, intern try, trying to create a new server. The intern, hopefully not the production environment, but could be for test system as well. It's just that if, if you think of it early enough, it's easy enough to deal with, as you said. You just put the, put the dummy certificate there and you're fine. Um, it's just, it, I just wanted to point out it's things like that that you have to think about. And I've, I've had that with, I mean, SSL certificates are relatively obvious in, in that area. Um, I also had it uh, in situations where a system runs multiple, ser multiple services that to a degree have a dependency on each other. Where you also have the problem that, yeah, it might not be up yet. Um, for example, I've, I've had to deploy Oracle databases. And then you have the problem, yes, when it starts up for a new database, it will take depending on your hardware, it might take a few minutes. And if you immediately try to do something with it afterwards, you have a problem. I mean, there are ways to say, okay, wait until, for example, there is the option where you could say, okay, wait for a file to be created. If you have to for, I mean, it's not really convenient, but sometimes it happens that you have some asynchronous stuff that you need to wait for because somebody thought it's uh, more convenient to have it asynchronously done, but the problem is you need the result of it. <laughs> so you have to wait for it anyway. Um, that, that, that's, the, that, that's the small things that I have to say that I just wanted to point out. So pre-prepare, if, if you want to have the safety, pre-prepare to deal with it. 
and yeah, I mean, I, either with adapting the system. Um, the other, the other thing is um, actually also your environment. Uh, I ran into the problem. It's I think it's probably not so much of a problem if you're if you're in a in in a company with a somewhat identical setup for workstations. But I also, for example, uh, am responsible at least partly for running the infrastructure of the Free Software Foundation Europe. There we basically have a mix of some people who are employed, some people uh, and, and a lot of volunteers. Basically all of them are um, responsible for, the all for their own systems, which means that you have a varied mix of some, some might run BSD in one flavor or the other, multiple Linux distributions, Windows is probably not common in that environment, but <laughs> so, so and, and, and multiple versions of, of uh, distributions, they might do upgrades at different times, which means different Python versions, different Ansible versions and stuff like that. That does create problems also when you install, also when you install Python packages um, to get some stuff running, um, a lot of the time you have the problem that it's still, some of the stuff is still uh, system packages that are different. So you can deal with that with things like uh, virtual environments, the slightly more complex or, or more fru um, bigger, bigger thing would be AWX. Uh, or Ansible Tower, if you want to go to the, the, the full Red Hat solution. Um, my experiences with AWX are a bit mixed because it currently requires Kubernetes to get it running, which uh, <laughs> yeah, I have seen your face. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it, well, then you have to decide, is it worth it or not? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to point out, it is a solution for the problem. It might not be the solution that you want to run. And as I said, it might not be a problem because if, you, if you're in a company where you have um, either a, centra, a central system where you execute your playbooks, because I've also seen uh, quite a few environments where you execute your playbooks um, out of a CI CD system, where you can also make sure that it will always be executed in the same environment that you can control and say, okay, now we want to update <laughs> or yeah, this playbook, uh, run that in this old environment, please. We haven't, done, we haven't touched that so long. It, it needs to run there. Yeah. Um, also, uh, synchronizing playbooks. I've had it in the past where uh, a colleague destroyed some work, um, not saying where, but uh, when they basically uh, edited the host configuration file and applied a playbook, not checking that there have been some serious changes to the configuration of this host in between, which will lead to anything from it being on an older level of, uh, on, a, on an older configuration to a broken configuration, whatever happens. <laughs> um, we're back, I think, to a degree in the procedural thing where you say, okay, please make sure before you start editing the stuff, please pull your Git repositories, make sure you're on the latest version. <laughs> Um, you might even have stronger rules. I mean, I've, we have uh, customer sites where you have to really make change requests and have a really complicated, oh, complicated, um, defined procedure for any small change that you want to apply. Then you don't have the problem. But on the other hand, for a small, for a small company, the overhead might not be worth it. Um, it might still be worth it if 
because I mean a small company can still deal with things where it gets really costly if you make small mistakes. Um, so it's just looking at the time, I'm nearly running out. Um, so uh, should I show some small examples or do you have any questions? Or a mix of, the <laughs> of both. Okay. Yeah, um, Katie, what? Uh, that might, uh, I might not have kept up with some uh, naming in the Red Hat space. I'm, 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 I'm not a Red Hat customer, so they might also have renamed stuff. Ansible Tower is the old name for what the, so for the free core of which is AWX. Um, it might also be only part of that. I'm, I'm, I can't completely say that. It depends.
So um, this is for example, this is one of the examples I talked about when I wanted when, when I needed to pr to adapt the hardware rate controller. Um, because I said, well, I have a cluster of three machines. I really want to have identical rate controller configuration because I don't want to deal with some strange performance differences because I somehow set the block size wrong somewhere. Um, so it's a relatively simple example where just configure the, the SSDs and the HDDs. And yes, I'm configuring single disk rate zeros here. Uh, reasons why the hardware was, yeah, okay. Um, I've just been shown that I have run out of time, so uh, <laughs> if you want to have any more examples, you will have to come to me. I will be available outside. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>